Today's hearing is laying the foundation, housing, accessibility, and affordability for older adults and people with disabilities. This hearing will also examine the importance of home modifications in supporting older adults and people with disabilities to remain in their homes. We know that stable, high-quality housing is an essential human need and the foundation of community well-being. This is especially true for the millions of Americans who wish to age in place and people with disabilities who prefer to live in their communities. A home offers, of course, physical protection and connections to community, to work, to education, and of course, to family. But for millions of Americans, adequate housing is more of an aspiration than a reality. In particular, for too many older adults and people, too many older adults and people with disabilities cannot afford accessible housing. Many live in unsafe housing or institutions, even though they prefer to live in communities, uh, the communities within which they raise their families. Accessible housing is a key feature that can assist people with disabilities and older adults to live in their own homes and chosen communities, something that research tells us over 90% prefer. An accessible home offers specific features or technologies such as lower kitchen counters and sinks, wider doorways, and zero-step showers. 26% of people in our nation have a disability. That's about 61 million Americans. By 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. But less than 5%, less than 5% of the national housing supply is accessible, with less than 1% of housing stock accessible to wheelchair users. Today, we'll hear from Dominique Howell from Philadelphia. She will share her story about experiencing homelessness after facing serious barriers to acquiring accessible housing. This, of course, and I think everyone would agree with this, is unacceptable. That's why in April, I introduced uh, legislation uh, entitled the Visitable Inclusive Tax Credit for Accessible Living Act, the so-called Vital Act, Senate Bill 1377, which would add funding to the low-income housing tax credit program, the nation's primary driver of affordable housing. This program does not currently have an accessibility standard contributing to the severe shortage of accessible and affordable housing. That is why the Vital Act would require that a percentage of homes built with this investment meet certain uh, accessibility uh, standards. We need to ensure that families have a real choice when it comes to the place that they call home. My legislation would ensure we are increasing the amount of accessible housing available for people with disabilities and older adults to meet their needs. Investments in accessible housing are central to guaranteeing better outcomes in health and satisfaction for both older adults and people with disabilities. Investing in accessible and affordable housing policies and programs is not only a life-saving action for those Americans, but will provide housing security for all. Whether it be for the young family who uses a stroller, the busy professional with a disability who wants to live near their work, or the recent retiree who's downsizing to age in place, all Americans, all Americans benefit from accessible housing. In recent history, we've seen advancements toward more accessible housing through efforts such as the Fair Housing Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and of course the Olmstead Supreme Court decision. Congress must continue to support national advancements in accessible housing and align the needs of millions living with disabilities and our increasing aging population. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about these important issues, and now I'll turn to Ranking Member Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing I do as um, a senator for Hoosiers is I travel and visit all 92 of our counties every year. I've also invited any Hoosier to come visit me in my hometown. When you do that, you get a lot of uh, good input. 
And I can tell you that a few issues, and Ms. Cannington, you and I had just talked about it earlier, and you uh, said they all kind of intersect, but uh, high cost of health care in our state is a big issue, uh, access to it, uh, how we spend our education dollars, which is the main responsibility of most state governments. Uh, and then you've got rural broadband in states like ours, and then the other thing, affordable housing. So how we get there in terms of getting all four of them to be in the sweet spot of what one can afford is probably the goal that should be mostly the responsibility of states because they live within the framework of a balanced budget generally and are more sustainable in what might be there for future generations. It affects uh, housing affordability all walks of life, including older adults and people with disabilities. Under the Biden administrations, Americans are less able to afford a home than practically any other time in our history. And a lot of times things we do here are well intended, but you cannot do it by borrowing from future generations and dumping the amount of money we did into the economy. It's created inflation, which is a tax on everyone. And gosh, look what it's done to affordability. Uh, spending policies, I think, have exacerbated an already unaffordable housing market. Uh, in 2021, when President Biden did take office, the average or the median home price was 369000 now it's 430000 And if you're good at math at all, you know in just that short a period of time, those are huge increases per year. Mortgage interest rates, which were around 3%, are now a little over 70 or 7% on a 30-year mortgage. That is pricing all kinds of people out of the market. Housing inventory. We know we need more of it. I hear it all the time. Even companies back in Indiana are trying to figure out how they can weigh into it. Estimates say the U.S. is between 3 and 6 million houses short of what the market needs. Many factors contribute to it, including regulatory burdens, both federal and state, infrastructure costs, supply chain constraints, largely maybe created by how we navigated through COVID. Workforce shortage, the number one thing I hear pre-COVID and post-COVID, and overall increasing costs of materials due to inflation. I think the solutions to all of these are probably left best to the laboratory of the states. And here, we ought to minimally have a guideline of regulations that are going to help not make it even worse. Federal government, I think, too, can help generally on the main drivers of an economy that folks are wondering, what do we have by not spending and borrowing more? Because you don't need a macroeconomics degree that creates inflation. We did the exact opposite of that. I think we can get back on track. Another issue is when he signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law, uh, which issued billions of dollars to encourage states to update their energy codes to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. I believe we got to be conscious of climate. We want to make sure homes are built to where they're going to spend less on utilities, but not when it creates an upfront cost that even exacerbates more the affordability issue. So sometimes when you want to do something, you got to make sure you get it, get the timing right. And now uh, we need to aspire to that, but we shouldn't mandate it. Here's another issue. Uh, there was recent a ruling that the average American credit score is over 716. Uh, interest rates have gotten higher, and now we've had a ruling that punishes people that earn good credit scores to help subsidize others. I think that's a wrong way to accomplish maybe a goal that is noble to help those that need help affording a place to live, but not like that. Uh, this is passed to overturn that rule by a large bipartisan vote in the House 
I'd like to see that occur in the Senate too. Do look forward. Sometimes we're at odds in terms of what we should do, but there's always practical legislation in the middle, and I'd hope that uh, we can have those conversations that get us there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Braun, thanks very much. Now I'll turn to the um, introduction of our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Jenny Schutz. Dr. Schutz is a senior fellow at Brookings Metro and works in urban economics and housing policy. Her research focuses on land use regulation, housing prices, urban amenities, and neighborhood change. Thank you for sharing your expertise and experience with us, Dr. Schutz. Our second witness is Ms. Allie Cannington. Ms. Cannington is the Senior Manager of Advocacy and Organizing at the Kelsey, where she leads policy and advocacy efforts to advance disability-forward housing solutions. She's dedicated to fueling justice movements for people with disabilities that are intersectional, sustainable, and intergenerational. Thank you for being here, Ms. Cannington, and sharing your expertise and your experience with the committee. I'll turn next to Ranking Member Braun for an introduction. My pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Rick Wajda. He's the CEO of the Indiana Builders Association, one of the state's leading voices on residential construction in the housing industry. Rick has been with the Indiana Builder Association for over 20 years and will share his knowledge and experience with the committee today. He joins us from Fishers, Indiana, not too far from his alma mater, Butler University in Indianapolis. Thanks, Rick, for being here today. Thank you, Ranking Member Braun. Our final witness is Dominique Howell, whom I mentioned earlier. Uh, Dominique is, is a, an advocate for the civil rights of people with disabilities, and she works to educate others about the discrimination parents with disabilities face. She has personally experienced the barriers that people with disabilities confront in finding accessible housing. Thank you, Dominique, for being here today and for sharing your story with the committee. And now we'll start with Dr. Schutz for your opening statement. Good morning, Chair Casey, Ranking Member Braun, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the important issue of accessible and affordable housing for older adults and people with disabilities. It's an honor to be here. My name is Jenny Schutz. I'm a senior fellow at Brookings Metro. My comments today will provide some broader context on housing challenges facing older adults and people with disabilities. Restrictive zoning makes it hard to produce enough housing to meet demand, especially accessible and affordable housing. Since the Great Recession, the US has not built enough housing to keep pace with the demand created by job and population growth. Local governments across the US have adopted restrictive zoning rules and complex discretionary development processes that decrease the amount of new construction and increase housing costs. Rules such as single family exclusive zoning create direct barriers to building accessible homes that meet the needs of people with disabilities and older adults. Accessory dwelling units, duplexes, and apartments in elevator buildings are all critical parts of the housing ecosystem that supports safe, independent living as well as informal caregiving within families. Rising housing costs create more financial stress for low-income households and people living on fixed incomes. The poorest 20% of households spend more than half of their income on housing costs, leaving too little money to cover other necessities. Rapidly rising housing costs are particularly challenging for older adults and people with disabilities who often live on fixed incomes. Among low-income people with disabilities, only 16% receive federal housing subsidies. Two recent trends foreshadow greater housing insecurity among older adults than in previous generations. A larger share of older adults today are renters, due partly to the lingering effects of the foreclosure crisis. Older homeowners also have higher debt levels because they are more likely to have a mortgage and larger mortgage balances. Retrofitting existing homes and communities is essential to improving safety and accessibility. The US housing stock is aging along with the population. Older homes are generally more affordable, but they are also more likely to have maintenance problems that can create unsafe or unhealthy living conditions. Much of the unsubsidized affordable rental housing stock lacks accessibility features, 
such as elevators and doorways wide enough to accommodate wheelchairs. Retrofitting millions of older homes is an enormous task that will require both private and public capital. An important policy consideration is how to balance the benefits of building codes and related regulations that require accessible features with the costs of property owners of conducting retrofits. Homes are only one piece of the built environment that impacts accessibility. Many older adults and people with disabilities cannot drive and therefore face challenges safely navigating their communities. Relatively inexpensive and fast infrastructure investments could improve neighborhood safety and accessibility. These include improving sidewalk quality, extending the time allotted for pedestrians crossing streets, and adding benches at bus stops. Removing regulatory barriers to neighborhood serving retail would also make it easier for older adults and people with disabilities to reach shared community spaces, from shopping centers to libraries and parks. Congress can improve housing accessibility and affordability for older adults and people with disabilities through four channels. First, create financial incentives for local governments to revise their zoning to allow a wider range of accessible housing types. The bipartisan infrastructure law includes some models for how to do this. Second, HUD should provide technical assistance and clear guidance to local governments on the types of zoning and building code reforms that are most important to accessibility and affordability. Third, provide flexible financial support for low-income older adults and people with disabilities through increased funding for housing vouchers or targeted tax credits. Fourth, encourage accessibility retrofits for existing homes and neighborhood serving pedestrian infrastructure through funding already allocated in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Expanding the supply of safe, accessible, affordable housing is a critical quality of life issue for millions of older adults and people with disabilities. Once in a generation, federal infrastructure investments offer a unique opportunity to upgrade the safety and accessibility of homes and neighborhoods. Accomplishing these goals will require sustained and coordinated efforts from federal, state, and local governments, as well as the private and nonprofit sectors. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Dr. Schutz, thanks very much for your testimony. Ms. Cannington. Chairman Casey, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the Special Committee of Aging, thank you so much for inviting me to testify today. I sit before you both as senior manager at the Kelsey and as a disabled person who's deeply felt the severe shortage of accessible, affordable, and inclusive housing <laughs> oh. in my own life <laughs> um, and in the lives of people I know and love across the country. Co-led by people with and without disabilities, the Kelsey pioneers accessible, affordable, and inclusive housing through public, private, and philanthropic partnerships to develop mixed income disability forward housing. We also advance market and policy conditions so that this type of housing can become the norm nationwide. Our country's housing crisis disproportionately impacts people with disabilities and older adults. This is why we are here today. And even more acutely, um, it impacts those who are black, brown, and indigenous. One in four adults are disabled and two in five seniors have a disability. Disabled people are twice as likely to live in poverty, and no one living on the supplemental security income can afford housing in any US market. People with disabilities experience the highest rates of housing discrimination, and less than 5% of our housing stock is accessible. At least half of those turning to shelters are disabled, and over 18 million people with disabilities are eligible for housing assistance, but not receiving it. Our country still upholds institutional bias with at least 3.3 million disabled people and older adults stuck in institutional settings because there isn't the housing that they need in their own communities. We have failed millions, but there are tangible solutions that can be enacted now to create what we call a more disability forward housing future. Disability forward housing is housing that is affordable to people of all incomes, especially those who are extremely low income. It is accessible, located, designed, and built to meet a diverse range of accessibility needs from cognitive to chronic illness to hearing and vision and more. 
It is inclusive, which means housing that does not segregate or isolate, but is mixed between people with and without disabilities and supports people to receive access to services in their own homes. Designing disability forward housing means designing better housing for everyone, people across geographies, incomes, and housing needs. It can include mixed income communities with homes ranging from deeply affordable to essential workforce housing. It includes resident-centered programming that brings elements of interdependence, informal support networks, access to services, and connected community living that benefit all. Designing for all kinds of bodies up front can lower costs. Not planning ahead can lead to unscheduled maintenance and a hit to already limited operating budgets. Disability forward housing does not have to make a project cost more. When comparing the costs of our projects at the Kelsey to others, ours are cost competitive, proving that this is possible. We have learned through our developments and technical assistance, as well as through the Kelsey's housing design standards for accessibility and inclusion, that with the right partners and investments, Disability forward housing can be scaled to transform the lives of people with and without disabilities from America's city centers to rural communities. We need though congressional and regulatory action to make this future possible. We have a, a legal framework to mandate fair and integrated housing, but we have never adequately invested in the housing infrastructure to make these rights a reality for the ever-growing disabled population. We can improve and invest in programs that we know work, but have been woefully underfunded, like HUD Section 811, 202, the HUD Service Coordination Program, Housing Choice Vouchers, including as well as, as specifically the Mainstream Voucher Program, as well as innovative project-based subsidy programs, as well as transit-oriented development and the Housing Trust Fund, as well as public housing. We must invest in and strengthen Medicaid home and community-based services, including housing-related services. We also can embed a disability forward solution across the entire housing infrastructure, like within the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, or LIHTC, which funds the vast majority of affordable housing and supports over 6 million jobs annually. Passing legislation like the Vital Act, Senate Bill 1377, would finance up to 970,000 more affordable, accessible homes over 10 years. It would be a critical step forward. We can increase requirements and incentivize access and inclusion across all federal programs and better align HUD and Medicaid. We can build new programs that make the right to community living for disabled people a reality. This includes creating voucher programs that are more explicitly for disabled people of all ages who qualify for Medicaid home and community-based services. And we can create a national home modification program for people who every day are left to their own accord to make essential changes to their homes as well as we can establish HUD senior leadership to oversee disability forward solutions are embedded across the agency. Through all of these interventions and more, you can move us towards a more disability forward housing future. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Cannington. And I, we'll move now to our fourth witness, Mr. Wajda. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Casey, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the Senate Special Committee on Aging. I am pleased to appear before you today on behalf of the Indiana Builders Association to share our views on the state of housing and the barriers our industry is currently facing to provide safe and affordable housing at all price points and for all sectors of the home buying public, including older Americans. My name is Rick Wajden. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Indiana Builders Association. The Indiana Builders Association represents over 2,600 member companies engaged in the residential and light commercial construction industry across the state of Indiana, and we are also affiliated with the National Association of Home Builders. The primary challenge to the building industry is the lack of attainable, affordable housing in the single family and multifamily markets. These challenges are consistent across the board for rental units as well as for sale housing. Indiana has done an excellent job over the years of attracting employers to our communities and making our state a great place to live. But with low inventory and rising material and labor costs, our members are having a difficult time providing workforce housing to Hoosiers. Record low inventory in a building industry that has not met current demand for new housing at various price points has created a shortage of available workforce housing. Estimates indicate a shortage of new homes across the state of 30 to 50,000 units. Put into context, Indiana needs roughly 18 to 22,000 new houses a year to meet average demand, and only produced over 18,000 new homes in 2020 for the first time since 2007. 
Why were home builders underbuilding coming out of the recession? After the downturn, the number of home builders declined significantly, and the availability of financing for acquisition, development, and construction activities were severely constrained. These factors significantly limited the production of new housing when housing demand was increasing across the country. According to the National Association of Home Builders Priced Out Report, the 2023 median new home price in Indiana is now $397,000. The income needed to qualify for the median new home price is roughly $120,000. Of the approximately 2.8 million households in Indiana, over 75% are unable to afford the median price of a new home. These numbers hold true across the country as well. In Pennsylvania, 86% of the households are unable to afford the median price of a new home. Ohio, 81%. Nebraska, 75%. Arizona, 81%. The U.S. average is 73% for households unable to afford the median price of a new home. On top of these already challenging dynamics, any increase in housing costs push potential buyers out of the market. In Indiana, for every $1,000 increase in the cost of a house, over 3,000 households are priced out of the market. That number is over 140,000 nationally. Take, for example, inflationary pressures and rising mortgage rates. In March of 2020, the new median house price in Indiana was $296,000, and the interest rate on a 30-year mortgage was roughly 3.5%. Assuming a 20% down payment, the monthly payment excluding taxes and property insurance was just over $1,000 a month. Today, that same house costs nearly $400,000, or 34% more, and the interest on that same 30-year mortgage is 7.25%, more than double the rate. As a result of these increases, the new monthly mortgage payment today is over $2,100, $1,100 more a month for roughly the same house. The fact is, home ownership is unattainable for many across Indiana and the country, including two earner households due to tight supply, inflationary pressures, regulatory costs, and rising mortgage rates, which is why we must look at reducing the cost of housing at all levels. According to the National Association of Home Builders Economics Group, nearly 25% of the cost of a new home nationwide can be attributed to regulations. Regulations come in many forms and can be imposed by various levels of government. At the local level, jurisdictions may charge permit fees, hookup fees, and impact fees, and establish development construction standards that either directly increase cost to builders and developers or cause delays that translate to higher cost. State and federal governments may be involved in this process directly or indirectly. For example, restrictive building codes add thousands of dollars to the cost of a house, making it that much more difficult to qualify for a mortgage. In terms of identifying solutions to improve affordability, we must rebuild the industry's infrastructure, which includes our labor force and reliable sources of lending and building materials. All regulations should be examined for their impact on housing affordability. Communities can reduce the cost of producing new housing by eliminating fee increases, assist with infrastructure costs and allowing for higher density housing where the market demands it. Our aging population may want to age in place or age in community. Creativity and options to allow this must be explored and implemented. In Indiana, the General Assembly recently concluded and passed legislation that creates a residential infrastructure fund to the tune of $75 million over the next two years to assist in communities building out infrastructure for residential housing. Think sewers, roads, sidewalks, et cetera. This transformative piece of legislation will open up areas for development and reduce the infrastructure costs currently paid for upfront by the builder developer, but ultimately passed on in the cost of the home to the home buyer. In conclusion, our citizens and particularly older Americans want to choose where they live and the type of home that best meets their needs. Our industry stands ready to assist in helping to expand the availability of safe and affordable housing. Thank you, Chairman Casey, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the committee for your time today. Thank you very much. And our, our final witness is Dominique Howell. Chairman Casey, Ranking Member Brown, and members of the Senate Special Committee on Aging, thank you for inviting me here today to share my story. My name is Dominique Howell. I am a disability advocate from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am an independent living specialist at Liberty Resources, Inc., a center for independent living in southeastern Pennsylvania. Today, I am here to speak about the importance of affordable, accessible housing in Philadelphia and nationwide. With a population of 12.90 million residents as of 2021 in Pennsylvania, disabled residents make up at least 25% of the population, which equates to 2,677,350 residents. 
I feel that it is imperative to, to focus on the needs of the disability community while also understanding that it is not just a regional issue, but a national one. Many of you may have realized that affordable, accessible housing in Pennsylvania, in, in Pennsylvania does not meet the demands of disabled residents in need. For decades, there has been affordable housing shortage, which has continually led to chronic housing insecurities. This includes homelessness and evictions because many residents cannot afford the rising rent cost on fixed income. For example, last year, the Independent Living Services Department of Liberty Resources, Inc. received an average of 100 calls per month for disabled people needing housing. This is especially true in Philadelphia, including myself. Five years ago, my family and I, which included my then three-year-old daughter and my aging grandmother, were wrongfully evicted due to a decision made by the owners of the property. They no longer wanted to make repairs to my inaccessible apartment, which was required by the Philadelphia Housing Authority to continue to receive payments. The owners made the decision that they would no longer accept the subsidy, which led to our eviction because we could no longer afford market rent, <coughs> rate rent on our own. With the help of some advocacy, my grandmother was able to be housed once we were evicted. Unfortunately for my daughter and uh, fortunately, my daughter and I weren't as lucky and were denied entry into the Office of Homeless Services twice because I am a recipient of home and community-based services and receive attended care hours. I receive home and community-based services so that I can remain living independently in the community. The Office of Homeless Services intake staff stated that my attendant could not enter the shelter because of the services I received. After getting legal representation and constant advocating, I was able to enter the shelter, but not without lack of accessibility. For a year, I slept in my power wheelchair, even while in the shelter. After fighting, advocating, and sharing my personal story, my daughter and I now have a place to call home. Even though my daughter and I now have a place to call home, it does not uh, it does not. It does not come without accessibility challenges. Unfortunately, even though the building we live in has other tenants with disabilities, the elevator is constantly broken, which leaves many residents, including myself, trapped in our homes, sometimes for weeks on end. My entire life, I had to make the decision between accessibility and affordability, as so many other Americans with disabilities do. As an example, for the first time in my life, I now have a a bathroom that is accessible enough for my wheelchair to enter and be able to close the door. As an advocate and activist, personally and professionally, one of my primary focuses is to continue housing justice because human housing is a human right and unfortunately far too many Americans, especially people with disabilities, are not being equally granted the right of housing they can afford that is accessible. It is my opinion that Pennsylvania and other states across the country should decrease their focus on market value development and increase their efforts to developing affordable, accessible housing to match the needs of its residents. It is my hope that uh, as members of Senate, you decide to take a stance and work diligently to help grant people with disabilities across the United States with their right of affordable, accessible housing. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thanks. Ms. Howell, thanks very much for your testimony. I wanted to start a round of questions. My first question is for Ms. Cannington. We know that, that people with disabilities face hardships. I think that's a real understatement. They face those hardships at a rate um, that is higher than people without disabilities. For example, they're twice as likely to live in poverty, to face a persistent wage gap, and to struggle to afford uh, housing costs. We've got to do more to ensure that f federal housing assistance programs are both, as we've said a number of times today, accessible and affordable for people with disabilities. I mentioned LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. It's the nation's primary driver of new stock affordable housing. This is a good program. It's had bipartisan support for many, many years. LIHTC provides tax credits to developers who build new housing for low-income renters, but currently there's no requirement uh, under the program as it exists today to build disability-friendly housing. It's just a gap in the program. Um, the, the VITAL Act that I've introduced would add an accessibility standard for that that uh, tax credit program, ensuring that investment and building of new 
affordable and accessible housing is possible. So here's my question, Ms. Cannington. Are states meeting the needs of people with disabilities through the LIHTC program? Thank you, Senator Casey, uh, for your question. So uh, as you spoke to, LIHTC is the primary driver of affordable housing. Um, and through LIHTC, all states are allocated tax credits. Um, and each state, through their qualified allocation plan, can decide um, where those tax credits can be prioritized. Uh, there are 28 states that completely, at the state level, also lack accessibility requirements. But then there are some states that are leading the way, um, that are adding both accessibility requirements and incentives. But the bottom line is that disabled people and older adults <laughs> no matter where they live in the country, should expect a standard of accessibility in the housing stock. And so by reforming uh, the low-income housing tax credit to both increase the requirement as well as incentivize developers to um, build more uh, accessible and adaptive housing, uh, the disabled people and older adults um, will be will increase their our confidence level um, and the standard, uh, as well as create more uniformity across um, the development field about what is what what is accessible housing and how can um, LIHTC, um ensure that it drives not just affordable housing but um, more accessible and adaptable to all. So you said twenty eight states um... completely lack tax credit. Um, accessibility requirements, and then there's 22 states that um, vary in, in their accessibility requirements. And so we look to the federal government for leadership in that mm -hmm. regard. Well, that's an interesting breakdown of all the states. I guess w one question I have is what are the characteristics of housing that's designed for the needs of people with disabilities? Kind of describe what would be, um, for lack of a better word, the ideal circumstance. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so at the Kelsey, um, and when we talk about disability forward housing design, we look at cross disability access. So that means not just meeting the um, minimum code requirements when they do exist, which is mobility and sensory, so important, but the 61 million disabled people, very, um, we are an incredibly diverse group. And so uh, we break down, um, those characteristics of access in six main impact areas. So hearing and acoustics, vision, health and wellness, cognitive access, and support needs. Some of the, um, some of the features and characteristics that I wanna lift up that, are, that go beyond code requirements, but by embedding them from the start doesn't have an additional cost, are things like plain language leases, um, are things like wayfinding in a building that um, when you implement these accessibility, these cross-disability access characteristics, it doesn't just benefit those groups, but benefits all. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I'll turn to Ranking Member Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wajda, you talked about in Indiana, the median home price, 397000 I mean, that just seems outrageously high as a median. And uh, that's actually higher than what the median is across the country. Interest rates, we talked about where they are. Um, but regulation, as it comes from here especially, can you cite a couple of the key regulations that drive costs up? And generally, they're always well intended, but then can work at cross purposes for the affordability factor. If you would highlight a couple of the most uh, challenging ones from here, and then likewise coming from our own state. Sure. Thank you, Senator Ron. The, the regulations are, are a huge factor, right? If you take, a, uh, take you roughly 25% of the cost of a home um, is due to regulations. I like to say that's no sticks and that's no bricks going into the house. That's simply uh, government regulations that further reduce housing affordability all across this great country. 
And so if you look at the federal level, it could be regulations dealing with stormwater. Um, you know, a recently uh, Supreme Court decided case, the uh, Sackett case dealing with wetlands on, on private property are all regulations that are ultimately added to the cost when a home builder and a developer is looking to develop a piece of ground, they have to take into account those regulations and pass those costs on to the home buyer uh, that, that continues to raise the cost of housing. At the local level, a lot of times we see architectural standards uh, baked into local ordinances. So certain communities want housing in their community to look a certain way. They may want all brick houses, they may want certain roof pitches, three car side load garages, uh, larger lot densities. Those are all things that we can provide as home buyers to the consumer and to the public, but those come at a cost. And so if, if we can get creative at the local level and communities can start to look at reducing lot sizes and allowing smaller houses to be built in their communities, uh, we think we can attempt to drive down the cost of housing. I want to give a shout out to um, a company in Indiana, the Cook Medical Group. Uh, who does medical device uh, manufacturing as its business, but has taken on trying to make affordable housing something that they're going to try to make uh, way in on. And in talking to uh, Steve Ferguson, the uh, CEO of the group, he said they found a formula to get housing in a slab home, three bedrooms, and I've seen them, and they are nice starter homes for between 185000 215000 which all of a sudden, if you're there, even with today's interest rates, look what you're doing in terms of affordability. I don't know how far that goes into the income quartiles, but if you could do that, and he said the single biggest factor was getting the local jurisdiction to stub in utilities, which most local jurisdictions can, and then it enabled him to be able to experiment to get homes built in that range. Does that happen much across Indiana, or would that be uh, the exception rather than the rule? I would say, Senator Braun, that's the exception rather than the rule, but, but it's certainly a creative approach that I think many large employers uh, may want to look. If, if they need workforce, uh, they're going to need to have some sort of cooperative agreement for housing uh, for their workers. And, and uh, Senator Braun and Chairman Casey you have a lot in common in terms of uh, a long, rich history in your states of the steel mills. Um, and a lot of those communities were built with the assistance of those steel mills back in there to make sure that they had affordable housing for their workers close to the factories. And, and maybe we've got to take a look at some of those cooperative partnerships moving forward with our employment community. Well, I think that's one example to where you don't have to look here. You can take that issue into your own hands, and we've had measurable results. I want to get a uh, final question on inflation. Uh, that robs across the board purchasing power. Uh, it's largely offset any of the wage gains that we've made. Uh, COVID exposed a lot of places where uh, employers uh, need to, to acknowledge that if you don't pay a living wage, uh, you're not only going to be losing the ability to have a, an affordable home, many other issues as well. I challenge employers throughout the country to make sure to take that into consideration. But what is the current status of inflation impacting building materials? Are we coming back down? Uh, is something within sight of where we'll get back to where we were pre-COVID? I think, uh, Senator Braun, you know, lumber prices certainly have came back down, but we've seen increases in other bu building materials that have continued to drive the cost of housing up. Uh, we have not seen that um, stabilize yet. And so, uh, as you see, you know, maybe the, the price of wood and lumber dropping uh, back to some pre-COVID levels, but we've also seen those increases in other products that continue to challenge the, the market. Uh, and certainly, you mentioned uh, with mortgage rates, uh, going up, right? The challenge to get somebody qualified for an entry-level home in the United States of America is very difficult right now. And so uh, we need to do everything we can to try to drive those rates down and get the cost of materials down so we can build more houses. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ranking Member Braun. I'll uh, start um, another round of questions. Now, we'll be waiting for uh, and are waiting for other senators to appear at the hearing so they can do their questions. So we'll have some 
who will appear in this segment of the hearing. And as some of you might know, we'll have to take, uh, Ranking Member Braun and I will have to take a break to go down to a Health Education Labor Pensions Committee, so-called HELP Committee, uh, markup where we're considering legislation, uh, pandemic all hazards legislation uh, that we've got to get done today. So we'll take a break and come back. And I think at that point, we'll have other senators. But for for the time being, I just have a, a few more for this round. Uh, Ms. Howell, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, as you know, many uh, people with disabilities and older adults prefer to remain in their homes. Uh, we, as we heard from Ms. Cannington, the current housing stock is largely inaccessible, forcing many to leave their communities for congregate settings, which um, in many instances would be a nursing home if you're an older, uh, older adult. We must ensure that older adults and people with disabilities can safely age in place and aren't forced to live in an institutional setting because their home can't support their needs. So Dominique, I would ask you, uh, how does the opportunity to have an accessible home impact your ability to remain in your own home and community? Well, the opportunity that I've been afforded to have an accessible home has allowed me to be a productive member of society, uh, a great advocate, and an even better mother. Without the opportunity to have an accessible home, I would not be able to do any of those things. I would not be able to be an independent living specialist. I would not be able to fight for housing justice, and I would not be able to be um, a loving, supportive parent. That's pretty fundamental, just be getting through your day and, and being a parent, um, so difficult. I was noting in your testimony that um, you said at the end of the, uh, the uh, third paragraph, quote, I was able to enter the shelter, but not without lack of accessibility. For a year, I slept on my power wheelchair, even while in the shelter, unquote. I can't imagine a year like that, but... Um, I hope, and it seems like things are a little better for you today. Things are wonderful. That's great. Full but, job and a full life, and so I'm blessed that there are many Americans that are not afforded that opportunity, and so that is why I'm here today. Yeah. Thank you for your question. And I'll, I'll next turn to uh, Dr. Schutz. I wanted to ask you about um, home modifications, which is part of the discussion here. People with disabilities of all ages need safe housing that supports their ability to live in their communities, but many live in homes not designed for their needs, and often they struggle to afford necessary home modifications, like installing a wheelchair ramp or a zero-step shower. These modifications help uh, these Americans prevent accidents and maintain their independence to help constituents primarily older adults and people with disabilities, as well as veterans, connect to resources so they can live and age in place. Our committee um, offers a home modification resource guide. I'm just holding it up. It's entitled, Modifying Your Home for Accessibility and Safety. And then this, this particular version says resources for Pennsylvanians. The table of contents kind of says it all. Um, there's a, a, a section or a chapter on resources for veterans, resources for uh, rural homeowners, resources for SSI beneficiaries, for older adults, for people with disabilities. Just by way of example, I was looking at um, the section on resources for rural homeowners. Um, th this is how it starts. It says, the Section 504 Home Repair Program provides loans and grants to low-income homeowners to repair, improve, and modernize their homes. It also provides grants to older and very low-income homeowners to improve health uh, and safety standards. So this is particularly focused on uh, Americans who are in rural communities. One of my constituents, Suzanne uh, Ott from Venango County, that's just north of, of Pittsburgh, told me how her husband uses a wheelchair, but because the doors are not wide enough in their home, he can't use it in the house. She said he has to, quote, crawl on his hands, his hands and knees to get inside the house and move around, unquote. Suzanne and her family used the home modifications brochure to find resources to widen their doorways 
and install stair, uh, stair lifts. She remarked how these changes will allow her husband to, quote, truly be independent, unquote, and to get around and do as he pleases. So Dr. Schutz, um, how can we better strengthen and streamline national resources for home modifications? Thanks for that question. Um, the home modifications are a really important part of making our existing stock more accessible. Uh, it's often complicated. Um, as Ms. Cannington said, there are a lot of different kinds of modifications that would be necessary, and it's a question of matching the home characteristics to the resident and to their needs. Um, so it's often hard to come up with a, with a fairly direct sort of cookie cutter version of this that can be implemented everywhere. We do know that some general rules of thumb for making programs more accessible is one, to make sure that there's targeted marketing and outreach to eligible households so that they know that these products are available. Um, second, to make sure that the application process is as easy and straightforward as possible, reduce the administrative burden so it's easy for people to access the resources that they're eligible for. Um, and then third, to make sure that there are trusted intermediaries who can help doing the contracting work to provide good quality work at fair prices and make sure that people aren't uh, overpaying for the services. So those are good, good general rules of thumb for making the program more accessible and making sure that the funding is spent well. Thank you, Doctor. Ranking Member Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I do visit all 92 counties in our state, by far the issue I hear even above and beyond rural broadband, affordable housing would be workforce. Uh, that was uh, pre-COVID. It's probably uh, mentioned twice as often now. In our state, we had 65,000 jobs that needed a better high school education, uh, basic life skills. When I went to high school, you could take engine mechanics. You could take wood or metal shop. You could learn to weld. Um, you had those kinds of uh, parts of your curriculum that I think prepared you, whether you're going to enlist, uh, go into employment right out of high school, or get uh, further education. Where are we at in our own state? Uh, I know when I was in the state legislature, uh, it was always talked about. It seemed like we never kind of aggregated our efforts towards it. And how big a deal is it uh, do we have enough electricians and plumbers and uh, let alone all the other kind of skills you need to build a home? Uh, how are we doing in Indiana? Great question, Senator Braun. And uh, the, the challenges are certainly there at all sectors of the construction industry, whether it's residential construction, commercial construction, road building. Um, you know, for example, our membership and our association was over 7,000 member companies across the state of Indiana before the Great Recession. Now we have shy of 3,000 members. A lot of those companies closed their doors. Uh, a lot of those folks went to a different occupation and didn't come back into the construction industry. And, and we have an aging workforce that is aging out of the construction industry, and we haven't backfilled enough positions uh, with our younger generations that – uh, to let them know there are great careers in the construction industry and can make a very good living for, for themselves and their families if that's the pathway that they desire. So uh, we're, we're making a very strong, concerted effort with all of our partners in the construction industry, commercial union, non-union, and residential as well, to let them know there are great careers out there. You can make a very good living. If you choose to go to a four-year institution, that's great, but you don't have to. Uh, you can go and, and become uh, an electrician, a plumber. We, we need more of those than um, you can imagine right now. They're in high demand. If you're willing to, to get a little dirty and, and work hard, uh, you can have a great living for yourself and your family. Well, it's uh, good to uh, let that out there so people know that's a place to go and where the cost of post-secondary education is gone. It's pricing itself out of the market. Uh, we're going to have to, you know, STEM degrees are underproduced in Indiana, for instance, and we need more of them to fill that high demand, very high pay niche. But then you've got high demand, high wage jobs that even through COVID have become more so. And if we threw the guidance that you get in high school, uh, companies need to reach out to their middle schools and high schools to get involved. Garrett High School, for instance, near Fort Wayne, they bought acreage next to their high school and they build a home each year. 
and the kids love it. Uh, they're going to make more money in many cases than most four-year degrees would produce, and they're going to have a job on the day they get their diploma and a job that can uh, pay for the things you need in this life. So I think education has got to come along to be part of the solution because if you're not getting enough, you're going to have to pay even more to get people into the field. And I remember, too, uh, Indiana Manufacturers Association, they wanted just the school system to produce that perfect employee mix that they needed. Well, that wasn't happening. That was as recently as eight years ago. I see that occurring, too. And some of the companies that are having the least amount of trouble hiring people are communicating with their local school systems. And then kids, they get those general life schools. And the parents get the information of high demand, high wage, cost of education, career wages. We can do a better job of getting people in places where we need it. And housing would be one of those places it seems like we got a lot of room to improve as well. But it does look like we're making steps in the right direction. Senator, I would agree, and right as I mentioned earlier, with the, yeah, the loss of so many subcontractors and, and building industry professionals uh, coming out of the last recession, if you have, if you're a residential home builder and you call five plumbers uh, and get quotes for a project, you're going to get a competitive bid. Today, that there might only be one plumber in town to to give you that bid, and so all those factors go into. Uh, the affordability challenges that we're seeing today is we, we need more workers, we need more competition uh, to try to continue to drive that cost of providing that service. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Braun. As I said, now we'll take a break. The committee will recess until 11 a.m. adults and people with disabilities. I'll turn to my colleague, Senator Kelly, because he was here when I walked in the door, and he's, as always, on time. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Dr. Schutz um, and Ms. Cannington, uh, Mr. Wadja, did I pronounce that right? And Ms. Howell, thank you, all of you, for being here today. This is a very important issue. Um, and this uh, question is for Dr. Schutz. So uh, my state, the state of Arizona, is currently dealing with a rather historic heat wave, multiple days in a row in Phoenix, uh, where the temperature has hit at least 110 degrees. The other day when I was there, it was 118. Um, and it's been above 110 pretty much every day of the month here in July. And the National Weather Service indicates that temperatures are going to remain above average for the rest of the month. And you've probably seen some of these headlines. And I expect you've also seen headlines on the study that found out that if there's a blackout in Phoenix during a heat wave, 50% of the city's population could possibly need emergency medical attention. And Phoenix has a population of over Maricopa County's about half a population of the state, uh, so over 3 million people. Now, we are fortunate that Phoenix has a pretty strong electrical grid, but these extreme weather events are happening more frequently. Um, and the low temperatures aren't really that low anymore. And we know that older adults are at risk due to extreme heat. And if you're in an older home, you're more likely not to have air conditioning. Uh, we've seen that uh, last week with some individuals. You're also not likely to have effective insulation in an older home, or you're not likely to have window shading, all of which can become very dangerous in these times of extreme heat. Um, the federal government, by the way, supports weatherization assistance which can make homes safer and better prepared to respond to extreme weather events. But Dr. Schutz, are we maximizing the use of these resources from the federal government that supports weatherization assistance? 
That's a great question. Uh, thanks, Senator Kelly. The short answer is no. <laughs> We're not doing a great job of getting the weatherization money into the hands of people who need it and into homes to provide uh, all the sorts of adaptive uh, features that you mentioned. Um, we talked before the recess that there are a number of ways that, in general, home retrofits could be made easier. The weatherization program uh, is undersubscribed. A lot of people who would be eligible for assistance don't know that they're eligible and so don't apply. Um, it's a very onerous process to apply and get access to that, to go through the screening process for income, uh, to have the home energy audit done. Um, and so thinking about ways to make that easier to access, uh, this also should work nicely uh, with some of the funding in the Inflation Reduction Act that's more focused on energy efficiency, but the two of those together, so things like uh, insulation and replacing windows and doors, upgrading heating and cooling systems, particularly cooling systems in Arizona. Um, those are really important for making the homes safer uh, and healthier for people um, and bringing down also energy usage so that people are spending less on their energy bill um, and the system stays, uh, stays current. Are there, have there been any surveys done to try to determine how many like what percentage of the population that's eligible even knows know that these programs exist? I would have to look to see. Um, I mean, the programs are, are pretty undersubscribed. Um, each state administers the weatherization assistance program a little bit differently. Um, and so some states have been more proactive about doing outreach. Uh, Maryland has done quite a lot of that to uh, encourage people who are eligible to know about it. Um, but that's a great question. I can look up those figures for you. OK, thank you. Um, and Ms. Uh, or Dr. Schutz, on a different but somewhat related subject, um, you know, one of the things I hear from affordable housing stakeholders all the time is the need for zoning reform to allow for some creative solutions um, to build new affordable housing. And I had some, you know, folks in my office just yesterday, including a, a woman who was uh, has been homeless. Um, and we were discussing, you know, how do we get more affordable housing in the state of Arizona? Um, one of the suggestions and one of the things that came up, um, you know, was something that uh, Tucson, Arizona locally did, which was allowing for the construction of accessory dwelling units, ADUs, on single family properties. But that's not statewide. Um, and these independent living situations are popular and carry a lot of benefits, including proximity to family caregivers, to support older adults and individuals with disabilities. So Dr. Schutz, in your testimony, I understand you highlighted how zoning rules that prohibit all structures except single family detached homes create direct barriers to building accessible homes. So recognizing that so much of housing policy happens at a state and local level, can you expand on your recommendations for how the federal government can support or incentivize state and local efforts to pursue zoning reform? Absolutely. Um, there's actually a lot of experimentation going on at the state and local level, places like Tucson, uh, states like Utah that have been doing state level reform. Um, and one of the really useful things that HUD could do is keep track of all of the reforms that are going on, make sure that the lessons we're learning for what works and what doesn't in different housing markets is accessible, uh, providing really simple, straightforward guidance. If you want to make ADUs work, here's a two-pager of the do's and don'ts. Um, so that state and local officials can get access to that. There's a lot of interest by elected officials at the state and local level in learning more about how this works, and there isn't really a good source of information or technical assistance. That would be a very easy thing that HUD could do more of um, in combination with targeting some of the transportation and infrastructure funds to encourage more, more uh, zoning reform. And we could probably do that even without legislation, I would think. I mean, just encouraging HUD to do that. So... Um, I'll make sure that my staff uh, works with you and we can try to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kelly. So we'll turn next to Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of our witnesses for uh, being here today. I want to build on uh, what Senator Kelly was talking there with regard to zoning. You know, owning a home is part of the American dream. And when I talk to my constituents, specifically in Omaha, who are home builders, one of the challenges they talk to me about is all the extra red tape that has come over the past several years with regard to 
uh, you know, the, not only the zoning, but all the regulations that go along with the codes and so forth like that. And that, that's creating a barrier to building affordable housing that would impact our seniors. And so, uh, Mr. Waja, you're with uh, home builders as well. A lot of my constituents tell me that the things, the regulations they face are local examples of what the state or the federal government is promoting. And that's creating some of the costs and the burdens uh, that they face. Can you talk to me a little bit about what can the federal government be doing to maybe help with cutting that red tape and helping our home builders build more affordable homes? Sure, Senator Ricketts, thank you uh, for the question. And, and a great example at the federal level is uh, uncoupling um, some legislation that has been passed that requires states and local communities to adopt the most recent edition of the building codes. Uh, for example, the adoption of the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code can add as much as $31,000 to the price of a new home and can take as long as 90 years for homeowners to see a payback on their investment. Uh, at a time when we're facing an affordability crisis across the country, uh, passing the most recent edition of, of an updated energy code, which does very little to increase the energy efficiency in already efficient new construction, uh, I think, you know, we could see as a, as a country much bigger bang for your buck looking at retrofitting some of those older homes as we talked about and some of the weatherization programs and others that could really uh, increase energy efficiency but not saddle potential new home buyers of new homes uh, from those increased costs. You know, was there a cost benefit analysis done on that? I mean, because the numbers you're giving are pretty shocking that would increase the cost of a home by that much when there are lower cost, readily available ways to be able to help improve on energy efficiency. Was, was there cost benefit analysis done on that? I, I think they, they look at some of those things and most codes are then adopted. The international codes are then adopted by states uh, uniformed or they make it they make tweaks to those depending on which state you're from and or in local communities. So a lot of states and local communities may take the international code and then change that to try to reduce those cost increases at their local level. But, uh, you know, we work very closely with our national association to make sure that policymakers are aware of uh, when new regulations are going to be passed, what that impact is going to be on their constituents in their home states. And when you say international code, help educate me on that. Why is it called an international code? It's in, uh, the International Code Council is a code writing body uh, as a nonprofit organization that actually writes the codes and then uh, states adopt those international codes in their states. But it is a a group of folks that get together to uh, promulgate, write new codes, and ultimately sell code books. And so who are they accountable to? Uh, they, they have a, a governing body. And who's that? who makes up that governing body? Uh, various uh, interest groups and local government officials, typically. So there, it's not an elected official body that's overseeing that, that is... Could be the local building inspector, could be from a community that's on the ICC board. Um, you know, very, very interesting. A lot of times maybe they're looking at safety and not necessarily safety and affordability. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said there was also, uh, so is there also potential for conflict of interest there from that standpoint of the people who are sitting on that, who are creating these codes that men that may then benefit from the codes that they're creating? I think a lot of the uh, things that we hear from, from our members of our organization is a lot of product manufacturers are very engaged in the code writing process and a lot of times that uh, if you add a product to the code that could increase the cost of housing, uh, obviously then uh, local states states and local communities have to look at that and say, is this something that we want in our home state? And, and a lot of times we have to then pull that section out of the code or learn to live with it and pass the cost on to the potential home buyer. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to, do you have any thoughts on how to reform that process? I, I think uh, having a, a more balanced approach uh, so that you have all sectors of the residential construction industry at the table with an equal voice and making sure that not we're taking into account not only safety but also affordability and, it, and as you mentioned early, really taking a look at that cost-benefit analysis of every new edition of the code that's going to be promulgated to make sure that the people that are going to be enforcing those new regulations understand the cost they're passing on to their constituencies. Great. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. We'll turn next to Senator Warnock. Thank you very much, Chair Casey. In addition to the aging committee, I also serve on banking and housing. 
And it's exciting to see those two committees intersect uh, on such an important issue. Over the past year, I've been working to improve uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, or uh, better known as LIHTC. Uh, Ms. Cannington, how do states meet the needs of people with, with disabilities through the LIHTC program? Thank you so much, Senator Warnock, for your question. Um, so as I spoke to in my testimony, LIHTC, as the nation's primary driver of affordable housing, is impacting um, positively the supply of affordable housing across the country. And yet um, there are still gaps in the program in that it does not um, uphold uh, a standard of, of accessibility um, that people with disabilities and older adults need across the country. Um, through federal guidance, uh, both and, and reform, we can create um, incentives and requirements within LIHTC to um, ensure that regardless of the state that an individual lives in, that they can expect that there is gonna be a supply of housing that is um, more accessible and adaptable. There also is a need for more um, data transparency and, um, and data collection. We are, you know, we know that less than 5% of our nation's housing stock is accessible. We know that disabled people and older adults experience poverty at higher rates and need accessible housing. And so the supply of affordable accessible housing is even less. And so how can we ensure that the, that the largest driver of affordable housing, LIHTC, really gives us an understanding of the supply that it's, um, rehab, that it's rehabbing and constructing and noting um, what that supply, how that supply is meeting the needs as well as not meeting the needs of Americans across the country. The lack of inventory, availability of affordable housing for people in general, particularly marginalized populations, and then persons dealing with that at the intersection of uh, disabilities that supply is even lower yeah. So we've got a lot of work to do, and that's why last year I introduced the Housing Market Data Transparency Act, which requires state housing finance agencies to submit data annually about uh, properties receiving. Um, Ms. Cannington, how could better data about uh, the LIHTC program inform better policies and improve the lives of Americans aging in place and adults with disabilities. Thank you again for that question, Senator. So as we know, and, and your um, legislation speaks to, multiple GAO report, reports um, have suggested that Congress should consider designating an agency to regularly collect the, and maintain specified cost-related data um, and we need to ensure that um, the data also collected um, is related to both levels of affordability and accessibility. So um, that, for example, Congress can then connect data on the number of homes funded by LIHTC based on AMI to track how the program serves people across incomes. Um, that can also be the same um, in regards to accessibility. Um, we, you know, we need more um, research to be done and more attention to uh, access and inclusion across the housing infrastructure. And if LIHTC, which is the primary driver of affordable housing, is really not taking into consideration the needs of the largest minority in this country, we're missing the mark. Well, thank you so much. I, I agree and I believe that increasing program transparency and data integrity of the LIHTC program would further underscore the program's record of success and allow us to have more accurate data. And this is not data for data's sake. Improved data transparency in the LIHTC program would then help inform policies and meet the needs of people with disabilities and Americans aging in place. Thank you so much for your advocacy uh, on this issue and, and for your testimony today. Thank you, Senator Warnock. I know we're, we're awaiting, um, I think, at least one more senator. 
But so I'll ask another question. I want to note for the record something I didn't do earlier. The uh, I, I mentioned the modifying your home for accessibility and safety. This new uh, publication, this in this this version is for Pennsylvania, but it also it's also been translated um, into Spanish. So we have that that um, resource available. I'll turn um, to for my question to Dominique Howell. I would as you mentioned in your testimony, if your home is properly accessible, it can make an immense difference and allow you to in, live independently and be integrated into your community. People with disabilities have historically been underrepresented in property development, and the expertise and leadership of people with disabilities is critical to the creation of more accessible homes. Your lived experience and work, hi, work highlight the need for more people with disabilities to be included in the conception of and development of affordable and accessible housing. So housing is made um, better for all Americans. Can you share the importance of including the voices of people with disabilities and advocates in housing development? Thank you for your question, Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, I think that representation matters. So we need to be at the table so that people can see us and know our stories and know what accessibility looks like firsthand, whether it's physical, whether it's cognitive, whether you're a deaf individual. And I think that if we are at the table and we help develop it, it will help uh, design and create more affordable housing the best way we know how. If you live the experience, you know the experience. So you're the, the best person to develop it because you know what you need as a disabled individual. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Dr. Schutz, I wanted to turn to you again. Um, we know that many older adults provide care for their grandchildren, uh, grand families as we've come to know them. These older adults may not have the physical infrastructure features in their home to accommodate uh, raising a young child. Features include uh, single floor living, zero step entrances and hallways and doorways wide enough to accommodate wheelchairs, walkers or strollers. And these not only make homes more accessible for older adults, but also for, for young children. As we've learned today, finding housing that meets this criteria is challenging. I've introduced bipartisan legislation called the Grand Family Housing Act, which would support housing providers in creating stable living environments for grand families and kinship uh, families. Doctor, how can we better support the accessible housing needs of multi-generational families, particularly those who are raising young children? That's a great question, Senator. Um, we know that people have figured out ways to live in extended families and multi-generational families forever. People figure out ways to do this organically. Um, but many of the rules that we've been talking about at the local level, zoning rules, make it hard to build the kinds of homes that accommodate that. Uh, so a very typical example used to be uh, you would buy a, a duplex or a triple-decker house and have different parts of the same family live together and provide care um, but have different units. Uh, we've talked some today about accessory dwelling units, which are a great way to provide a unit on the same property that can either accommodate a caregiver, adult children, older uh, adults who want to live with their, with their younger children. So these kinds of diverse structures provide an ecosystem of housing that supports a lot of choices. Um, and if we take away some of the regulatory barriers and allow these to be built, including allowing conversions to happen in existing properties, then we provide a wider range of options and people can choose the option that works best for themselves and their families. Thanks very much. Senator Ricketts, do you have any other questions? Yeah. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you'll have to tell Senator Brown I was trying to schmooze him while he was, he, he was supposed to be here for this, so I could say I was, uh, wanted to compliment him on his introduction and his leadership of the Middle Class Bower Protection Act, which I co-sponsored, but he's not here, so you have to tell him that I was trying to compliment him when he was, when he was I'll make sure to do that. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, it, uh, it is uh, concerning when the administration wanted to change the low-level pricing for families that you're essentially taxing the American dream. You're rewarding people who weren't making as good um, the financial decisions and punishing people who 
uh, were doing the right thing with regard to their financial decisions, who had better credit scores and so forth. And that's obviously uh, very concerning. Mr. Waja, in your opinion, what specific impact analysis or studies should be done before you make changes like this that are going to change this single family pricing framework? Senator Ricketts, thank you very much for your question. And, um, our National Association expressed concern about the increased upfront delivery fees for many borrowers with the new LLPA matrices when they came out in May of this year. Uh, whether it's paid as a closing cost fee or through increased interest rates, increasing the LLPAs only serve to act as a tax on home ownership in an extremely vulnerable market. However, our industry believes that Congress should remain focused on the comprehensive reform of the housing finance system and certainly understand that uh, when those fees are, are passed on, right, there is a cost to home ownership across the country. So what sort of collaboration or input should be received before making changes like this? Like how would you structure this to advise the administration before they make changes in this kind of policy? Senator Ricketts, I think uh, having that uh, discussion with this, the various stakeholders and how it's going to impact uh, certainly the housing industry as a whole, uh, bringing, the, bringing those stakeholders into those conversations and having that dialogue on the front end. Uh, we certainly could have um, had that conversation to make sure any change in, in what that impact was going to be on housing affordability. To your knowledge, do you know of any sort of collaboration input, forums, public meetings, anything like that the administration did before considering this? Um, I, I certainly have to check with our National Association staff on that and whether there was any collaboration between those organizations. So, but you're not aware of any personally? None to my knowledge, no, sir. That went on that. And so what kind of implications do you think what this would have for housing affordability if this rule were in place? I, I think certainly any fees that are passed on uh, have to be, uh, whether it's passed on in the cost of a mortgage or passed on to the home builder and ultimately to the home buyer, uh, any increase in the cost of housing is going to price people out of the market. So it's going to actually lead to less accessibility rather than more accessibility. Correct. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Yeah. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. I'll move to our, my closing statement for the hearing. And if our colleague arrives, uh, they, they can be slotted in before we adjourn. And I want to thank Senator Ricketts for, for uh, coming back to the hearing and also uh, standing in for Senator Braun. We're grateful for that. It's a busy Thursday. We have multiple competing committees all at the same time. So we're grateful for his work. So as we conclude the hearing on accessible and affordable housing for older adults and people with disabilities, it's imperative that we understand the need for stable, high-quality housing to ensure the well-being of older Americans and Americans with disabilities. Today's witnesses have talked about the importance of increasing the stock of accessible and affordable homes, as well as embedding accessibility into housing standards. Accessible housing includes features people may need to live independently, like wider doorways, uh, clear floor space for wheelchairs to move throughout the home, low countertops, assistive technology, and grab bars in bathrooms. Accessible design is essential to ensure the inclusion and active participation of all people in society. Accessible housing that ensures all people have access to a home they can live in. And as we've heard today, living in uh, well-fit homes ensures community engagement, professional opportunities, and educational options. But building accessible homes requires joint efforts in the active participation of everyone from people with disabilities to developers to advocacy organizations to federal and state governments. And the unfortunate reality is that millions of older Americans and people with disabilities see accessible housing only as a dream. People like Dominique, who said, quote, my entire life, I've had to make a decision between accessibility and affordability, so, as so many other Americans with disabilities do daily, unquote. No one, no one should have to make that choice. Dominique's comment, as well as the ones made by other witnesses, reinforces the lack of accessible homes and the challenges older adults and people with disabilities face when trying to find and pay for their, these homes. The 5% of national housing stock with even basic accessible features is clearly inadequate when 26% of our fellow Americans have a disability. I mentioned earlier the VITAL Act 
uh, which incentivizes the building of affordable homes uh, that are also accessible. As members of Congress, we must continue to commit to ensuring investment to increase the stock of accessible and affordable housing to meet the needs of millions of people with disabilities and older adults. So I want to thank you for your testimony, and I will now turn to Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding this hearing today. It's such an important topic. It, the housing shortage is a national emergency that lies at the root of what makes buying or renting a home the single largest line item in most families' budgets so wildly unaffordable to too many Americans today. We know how to solve the problem. We need to build more housing. And not just more housing, but more of every kind of housing. Housing for seniors, housing for people with disabilities, housing for veterans, housing for families with children, housing for single people, housing for first time buyers, and on and on. That undoubtedly will require new housing development and construction, and I believe we need serious federal dollars to help make this happen. But there are also things that we can do to make the most of the construction that we already have. For example, towns all across this country are taking a look at their unused non-residential properties, like office space or long abandoned public buildings, to see if those spaces could better be used to serve their communities as housing. Dr. Schutz, you have extensive experience studying the housing market. Now, property conversions may not work everywhere all the time, but we are seeing communities successfully using housing conversions to create accessible and affordable housing for some groups. Are you seeing this as a way to produce more housing for older Americans, for people with disabilities, and for other groups? Absolutely. Conversion of non-residential buildings to housing can add substantial amounts of housing. If we look at cities like Los Angeles, for instance, the downtown converted a lot of empty office buildings, and they work really well for accessible units because they're already tall buildings equipped with elevators, so they can work really well in some yeah. contexts. Yeah. You know, I, I want to say we're doing some of this in Massachusetts right now. Over the last few years, we've seen creative projects to convert existing non-residential construction to homes for older Americans and for the broader population. In New Bedford, a 114-year-old textile mill is being converted into apartments for lower and middle income adults age 55 and older. In Salem, two century, uh, uh, cent I'm going to say this wrong, in Salem, two century-old Catholic schools are being converted to a mixed-income apartment for seniors and artists. Um, and earlier this month, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu announced a bold pilot program to immediately create residential housing out of unused office space, and there's a lot of it, with about one in five of every commercial office buildings in downtown Boston currently vacant. Federal investment in converting formerly non-residential properties into housing could help more communities expand their housing supply in a way that fits the needs of target populations, like older adults who need accessible and centrally located homes. Accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, another tool that communities can use to get the most out of their existing construction. These units tend to be on the smaller side, something that homeowners can build on their own property and then use it as rental housing. Think of a mother-in-law unit uh, on the back of the lot or maybe an efficiency apartment over a garage. Dr. Schultz, could you say a word about how accessory dwelling units help address the housing shortage, especially among older adults? Accessory dwelling units can fit in a couple of ways. They can provide a space on the property for a caretaker to live, or they can provide a space for adult children to move in. Um, I would point to both California and Utah as states that have done a lot to push making accessory dwelling units easier to build at the state level. Uh -huh. Ms. Cannington, would you like to add to that? You seem engaged in this conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, I just 
want to add the importance of both a carrots and sticks approach to the affordable, accessible, uh, and inclusive housing crisis that we have. Um, it is, you know, it is essential that we have accessibility requirements that um, accurately reflect the needs of the growing disabled and older adult population. But the bottom line is without incentives, um, the developer field um, will only continue to see access as a compliance issue. But what we know is that access um, is uh, an opportunity for everyone to thrive at levels that we have really never been able to uh, fully realize in this country. Yeah. I, I think that's a really powerful point here. You know, this is something where my view on this is more is more. We need more. Uh, in the last few years, several towns on Cape Cod have agreed to reform their zoning laws to allow for the creation of ADUs to boost the supply of year-round housing for residents. Local advocacy groups have stepped up to provide modest financial incentives and practical assistance to homeowners to help them get ADUs in place. I get it. ADUs and conversions may not work everywhere. Every community's housing stock is different and particular needs are different. And there's no getting around the need for a major federal investment if we want to close the housing gap. But we can also help move the needle with more targeted federal investments that support and expand communities' efforts to boost their housing stock and to ensure that everyone, and I want to underline everyone, has access to safe, accessible, and affordable place to live. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Warren, thanks very much, and thanks for being with us today. I'll, I'll wrap up by saying that um, I want to start by thanking each of our witnesses for their time today, their testimony, the experience, both life experience as well as uh, a professional experience, and I also want to thank you for your patience in allowing us to have a, a break in between so Senator Braun and I could get to the to the help hearing. Um, I will be submitting nine additional statements for the record for uh, from various constituents and stakeholders from Pennsylvania who have experienced issues with finding accessible and affordable housing and are calling on the need for more development. If any senators have additional questions for the witnesses, or statements to be added to the record. The hearing record will be kept open for seven days until next Thursday, July 27th. Thank you all for participating today. This concludes our hearing.